I take this uh, opportunity to discuss about the inherited cardiomyopathy and arrhythmias. And we all know that um, cardiomyopathies are primary diseases of the myocardium, where they cause structural and functional abnormalities. If you look at the arrhythmias, primary arrhythmia syndromes are primary electrical diseases in which the heart is structurally normal. And arrhythmias are associated with cardiomyopathies as well. It's obvious that these, uh, both of these uh, are important causes of sudden cardiac death. The learning outcomes for this uh, brief presentation are given on this slide. First of all, we will talk about the cardiomyopathy. Many systematic classifications and definitions have been proposed for the, to define the cardiomyopathy since 1957. And the definition that you see on the slide was proposed by American Heart Association in 2006. And this is the first known definition that addresses the genetics as a cause. Accordingly, the primary cardiomyopathies were classified into three, genetic, mixed, and acquired. In 2013, uh, descriptive nosology was uh, proposed and it is called as MOX classification and it combines five important characteristic features of cardiomyopathic disorders. They are the morphofunctional traits, organ or system involvement, inheritance pattern, identified genetic defect or other non-genetic etiologies, and finally, information about the functional status. For example, if you uh, look at the G notation, it provides information regarding the pattern of inheritance based on pedigree analysis. Cardiomyopathies can also be classified into a couple of types according to their effects on the cardiac structure and function. This morphofunctional based phenotypic characterization is important because the, at present, the diagnosis and management of cardiomyopathy is based on this. Outline of important features of each type is shown in this slide, dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic ventricular cardiomyopathy, and finally, the restrictive cardiomyopathy. Let's move on to talk about the genetics of dilated cardiomyopathy. So in dilated cardiomyopathy, a familial form of the disease is present in at least 25% of the cases. And we know it is genetically heterogeneous. And in most cases, the autosomal dominant inheritance pattern with incomplete and age-dependent penetrance is observed. Anyway, the other forms of inheritance like autosomal recessive, X-linked recessive also being reported. It is caused by mutation of the genes related to structure and function of the nuclear envelope, cytoskeleton, sarcomia and sarcoplasmic reticulum of the cardiac myocytes. And uh, DCM is a common complication of uh, neuromuscular disorders. The classical example is the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. At present, there are 60 genes are known to be associated with this condition. And what you see on the slide is a list of important genes recommended to be tested in individuals suspected to have dilated cardiomyopathy. This is in accordance with the guideline of American College of Medical Genetics and Genome. Among these genes, the two genes highlighted are more commonly associated. Let's look at the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy then. This is the most common form among the cardiomyopathies. And uh, usually the majority of them follows the autosomal dominant pattern with high degree of penetrance and variable. It is also known as a disease of the sarcomia because uh, about 90% of the cases are caused by mutation in one of the structural or uh, the regulatory genes of the. This slide shows you the important genes to be screened uh, 
uh, in the suspicion of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Among these genes, you can see the co-genes as well as the secondary findings genes, and all these are in accordance with the ACMG guideline. And you can see the two genes highlighted here. In other words, the mutation in these two genes account for almost 80% of all cases. So they should be incorporated in the gene panels. Next to that, the troponin gene defects contribute in a considerable manner. When we consider the arrhythmogenic ventricular cardiomyopathy, predominantly the autosomal dominant inheritance pattern is observed. And you can see the list of important genes that can be uh, considered in the screening of this condition. And uh, this condition is actually caused by mutation in, you can see uh, one of the genes that encode desmosomal proteins. The most common one is the placophilin, or in other words, PKP2 gene that is highlighted here. And the uh, recent evidence suggests that genetic testing of a couple of selected genes, you can, you can see the genes highlighted in green color can identify about 63% of the cases with ventricular, uh, sorry, arrhythmogenic ventricular cardiomyopathy. Finally, we will talk about the restrictive cardiomyopathy. It is relatively a rare form and uh, it usually follows the autosomal dominant pattern, majority of the cases. And the genetic causes of these conditions actually continue to be studied and a lot of information has to come. And it includes proponinopathies and desminopathies. The clinical differentiation of these two is very important because the proponinopathies are associated with high risk to uh, arrhythmias. And uh, desminopathies are having or showing the negligible risk in this case. And both of these are associated with high penetrance. As a result, what happens is uh, almost all the mutated individuals will show or manifest the signs and symptoms of the disease at the age of 40 years. So genes related to restrictive cardiomyopathy for screening, you can see here, usually uh, they are the genes that uh, usually we use for the screening of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. And you can see the diagnostic yield is between 10 to 60% in this case. And again, it is guided by the um, American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. So another question arises, uh, what about the genetic testing in Sri Lanka? Uh, the, to the best of my knowledge, it appears that uh, genetic screening for cardiac disorders, including cardiomyopathies and the primary arrhythmia syndrome, is not a common practice. But uh, it appears that uh, there, are, there are private laboratories. Uh, to my knowledge, one laboratory has the facilities to screen the genes related to cardiomyopathy. And the list of genes uh, that are screened by the particular laboratory, this is based on the information, you know, got it from the, their website. And this can be screened at present. They have the facility to do that. Then we'll move on to the next important part of this uh, presentation, arrhythmias. And the primary arrhythmia syndromes is a group of genetically and clinically heterogeneous inheritable arrhythmic disorders. And usually the majority of them follows autosomal dominant pattern with incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. And uh, that is also important in this case. The common types includes the long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, short QT syndrome, and the CPV. The outline of important features of each type are shown in this slide. Long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, short QT syndrome, and the CPVT. Let's look at the genetics of long QT syndrome now. The phenotypic expression of genetically affected individuals varies considerably. In fact, uh, about 25 to 50% of the individuals who have the mutation for long QT syndrome have borderline or normal QT levels. 
And two types of pattern of inheritance uh, has been uh, observed. And one is uh, autosomal recessive disease that is um, associated with deafness. It has a special name, but this is a rare form compared to the other one. The autosomal dominant disease is uh, unassociated with deafness. It is called as romano ward syndrome. And if you look at the genetic causes of these two, the autosomal recessive form is um, related to mutation in a cardiac potassium channel. And there are two genes that are associated. If you look at the autosomal dominant form, that is the common form I mentioned, is caused by mutation in eight different genes. I'll show you uh, in the next slide. Among these eight genes, six genes are related to cardiac potassium channels, and one is related to cardiac sodium channel, and the remaining one is associated with the protein anhydrin. The important fact is mutation in one of these three genes highlighted here is associated with almost 85% of the cases. So the genetic screening panel should include these genes. Then when we consider the Brugada syndrome, two forms exist. One is autosomal dominant, other one is the sporadic occurrence. And it is linked to the mutation in a cardiac sodium channel gene that is called 5CN5A. That is only in 20% of the patients. It appears this is the commonest gene that is related to uh, Brugada syndrome. And when we consider the genetics of short QT syndrome, it is associated with mutations in the three genes listed here, KCNH2, KCNQ1, and the KCNJ2. Finally, we will focus on the genetic basis of CPVT. And there are two inheritance patterns exist in this case. One is the autosomal dominant form, other one is the autosomal recessive form. In case of autosomal dominant form, it is uh, associated with mutation in an important gene called RYR2. And this is responsible for up to 60% of cases with CPVT. And the autosomal recessive form is linked with the mutation in the CASQ2 gene. Then the next question arises, do we screen these genes in Sri Lanka? So I mentioned there's a private laboratory that has um, appears they have the facilities to screen these genes along with the other genes the, that is that are related to inherited conditions. And their gene panel include these genes also in the uh, that can be used to diagnose, detect these uh, conditions. Right. Genetic counseling is uh, recommended for patients and at-risk family members with uh, inheritable cardiac conditions. And as we all know, it consists of pre-test and post-test counseling. And the pre-test counseling usually begins with the construction of a three-generation pedigree, at least. And uh, this will uh, help the clinician or the geneticist to determine the pattern of inheritance that is uh, present in the family, as well as whether there are any other features of cardiac disorders or uh, any unexplained sudden death occurred in the family. And uh, I repeatedly mentioned that uh, most of the cardiac uh, genetic cardiomyopathies and the channelopathies are inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. In addition, the incomplete penetrance seen in these uh, disorders uh, gives a clue to us that there could be a considerable proportion of asymptomatic carriers in among the family members. So this information should be conveyed to the uh, family members as well as the patient in order to uh, you know, facilitate the remaining process, particularly the genetic testing when it is required. Other issues includes the guilty uh, feel by the parents and the psychological concerns, autonomy, including informed consent and others, and the confidentiality, all these have to be maintained and ensured during the pre-test counseling. When we consider the genetic testing, we all know that uh, the genetic testing is uh, important for the confirmation of the diagnosis and um, also 
probably for the estimation of the risk and uh, may contribute in the prognosis and also in the management of the genetic conditions. So the recommendation for the genetic testing and counseling varies between cardiac disorders, but uh, I just want to highlight uh, the general pattern that we can consider. Obviously, the purpose of doing the genetic testing is to identify whether there are any pathogenic or mutations mutation or mutations present in the genome of the suspected person. And uh, in case of cardiac disorders, for probands, it is uh, advisable to begin the genetic screening with the clearly confirmed affected individuals. And usually the diagnosis can be made at the, sorry, the detection and genetic testing can be made at the time of diagnosis or even soon after following as, as early as possible following the diagnosis. It is important to see um, that in case of cardiac disorders, generally using the multi-gene panels is advisable over the use of individual genes in the proband. Right? In the proband, it is always important to use the multi-gene panels. And some people argue that argue or recommend that small specific panel of genes also can be used if we have a well-defined phenotype. If you have a confusing phenotype, overlapping phenotype, it is always better to uh, use the multi-genes panel. Okay, now the uh, proband is detected with a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant. So what is the next step? The next step is the cascade genetic testing of at-risk family members depends on the cardiac condition. For example, LQTS syndrome, it is very important. And specific guidelines for genetic testing and the, uh, genetic counseling and all these things are given in the reference uh, articles. You can go through it, uh, later on. And uh, once the diagnosis, once the detection is made in the proband, then the, during the cascade testing, we may use targeted analysis. We may focus on that and it is performed at the level of individual genes. The individual genes are the genes that were associated with the disease in the program. So what is the importance of identification of at-risk family members is the question. It is important because uh, in case of cardiac disorders, the first presentation may be sudden death. So prevention is uh, very important in that case. So you have to focus on uh, identification of at-risk family members. And it is also indicated that uh, identification of a molecular cause, a particular mutation in a particular gene, may be helpful in uh, initiating the gene-specific cardiac or extra cardiac management recommendations uh, whenever it is applicable. Finally, the post-test counseling plays an important role in the cardiac disorders. And we all know that uh, post-test counseling should combine all the information, including the clinical information, the family history, and the genetic testing uh, to give a proper uh, counseling to the uh, patients as well as the uh, at-risk family members. And sometimes geneticists uh, may face difficulty in case of cardiac disorders because it shows uh, complex inheritance and incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. So determining the risk sometimes may be confusing to the geneticist. And uh, detection of certain variants also may guide the treatment for the patients and also uh, make some lifestyle modification and others in the at-risk family members. Like some in the at risk family members, uh, we can do some lifestyle modifications. So, these are the future goals that we have to take from now. And this is a case scenario that will be discussed in the latter part of this uh, uh, seminar. And these are my references. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you.